Welcome to another series of sermons on the parables of the Bible. We're studying the parables of the Old Testament and uh, some of the stories of the Old Testament that are true historical acts. I want to read to you from one of our textbooks. The Bible is our main textbook, but uh, <coughs> Herbert Lockyer wrote a book, All the Parables of the Bible, and we're using some readings out of this book to to enhance our class on parables. On page 17, in all the parables of the Bible, it says parable. While we are already, while we have already dealt with the nature of a, of a parable, we return to it by way of summary in a parable. An image is borrowed from the visible world and it is accompanied by a truth from the invisible and spiritual world. Parables are the bearer, the channels of spiritual truth and doctrine. What must be emphasized is that parables do not run on all fours. Everything in a parable. One of the problems with people, especially those that allegorize all the scripture, spiritualize the scripture, is they try to make a parable work on all fours. And you will see this as the parable of the sower and many things. They'll try to make it mean all kinds of spiritual things instead of what it actually means. In some, there are great disparities. Some, as fact, we cannot apply spiritually. They are always related to the territory of the possible and the true. Speeches and sentences full of spiritual wisdom and truth are called parables in two, for two reasons. Because they carry conviction and divine authority. Because they are touchstones of truth. They are standards, they are rules, and therefore ought to rule. A parable has defined as a beautiful image of a beautiful mind. A parable is also a juxtaposition, side by side of two things dif differing in most points, but agreeing in some. Miracles, says A.T. Pearson, teach us the forces of creation, the parables of the forms of creation. And when a parable is predictive and prophetic, it is always allegorical dress when perception and didactic, actual and historical. The merit of parabolic instruction. Teaching by parables serves many useful ends and possesses the distinct advantages. Its merit or worth as an instrument of teaching lies in its beginning at once. A test of the character with which, as a penalty of a blessing, is adopted. Parables sometimes withdraw the light from those who love darkness. Parables protect the truth which they enshrine from mockery of the scoffer. They leave something with a careless which may be interpreted and understood afterwards. They reveal, on the other hand, seekers after truth. Parables may be listened to and their meaning received, yet the listeners may never care to ask what is the actual meaning. Among many of the advantages for proving the profitlessness of a parabolic scripture, mention can be made of the following. Parables attract. When fully understood, they attract and are sure to be remembered. They are a great help to memory. They are more apt to remember illustrations of stories than other things delivered in a sermon. Remember that. People are more apt to remember stories and the illustrations of that scriptural truth than the very scripture itself. Parables are called to remembrance long after the main substance of the sermon is forgotten. Parables greatly help the mind and thinking faculty. Their meaning must be studied. They are like a golden mine. We must dig and scratch with all diligence. We would discover the true vein. The parabolic method arouses thought. The great teacher himself knew that he could not teach his hearers unless he made them teach themselves. A great teacher will make his students think. A great teacher will make his students understand. A great teacher will institute learning and make his students think. 
he must reach their own minds and get them to work with his. The form of the parable will attract all, but only the thoughtful could read its meaning. The meaning could not be found without thinking. The parables, therefore, both attract and sifted the crowd. They attract and sift the crowd. Parables stir up or excite the affections and awaken consciences as when hell is a, in a parable is set up as a furnace of fire. And conscious by a gnawing worm, parables arrest and hold attention. Listening to Jesus as he spoke his parable, the listeners were uh, thralled and said, Never a man spoke like this man. He must make the people listen to him, and he did. How wonderfully he would swiftly and spontaneously use the suggestions of the moment and thus catch and keep the attention of those around him. Parables preserve truth. Parables preserve truth. Sometimes we preserve meat in cans. Sometimes we preserve vegetables and fruits in cans. And parables preserve the truth. Writing on this particular merit, Cosmo Lang said, What men think out of themselves they never forget. They exercise their mind. The exercise of their mind makes it their own. The exercise of their mind and their own thinking makes it their own. It becomes part of them. Moreover, the language of symbols expressed in what is seen by the eye or pictured by the imagination is more powerful and enduring in its effects than the language of mere abstract words. It conveys and brings back to the mind the inner meaning with swiftness and sureness. It carries with it the wealth of suggestion and association. And mere words are constantly changing their meaning. Whereas the symbols of life and nature, such as our Lord used in his parables, are as abiding as nature and life themselves. The mission of parables. The mission of the parables. Closely allied to the merits of the parabolic form teaching are its motives and mission. We're on page 18. What are the functions and objects of the parable? We have touched again upon the drawing power. But why Christ used such a method he employed it to enlighten, exhort, and edify. In the preface of his illuminating lectures on the law on the Lord's parables, Dr. Cummings says that prophecy is the cartoon of the future, which in events fill in. Miracles are the four acts of the future done on a small present scale. Miracles are the four acts of the future done on a small present scale. Jesus healed the blind. Jesus provided food because these were his messianic credentials and they were his sample case of millennial blessings. Parables are a foreshadow of the future projected on the sacred page. All three grow every day in radiance, in interest, in value. Soon the light of the meridian sun will overflow them and we will be found ready. By it he sought <coughs> to command to men's understanding and the hearts the spiritual truths of his kingdom, doctrine to a method that was recognized by Jewish teachers. Christ attracted the mind and conciliated attention. Men had to be won, and a parable was a ready means, a tool of securing this. He was superb in the use of it. Jesus adopted the parabolic form of teaching, whether addressing him, the disciples, or those of the Pharisees who were his foes, in order to convince the one group and condemn the other. The question of the disciples, Why speakest thou in parables? Matthew 13.10 is answered by Jesus in the following five verses. Jesus opened his mouth and spake in parables because of their diversified character and degree of a spiritual and moral perception in his hearers' hearts. Matthew 13, 35. Therefore I speak to them in parables. Therefore implies it is because the instruction so often given to them in plain language had proved of no avail to them. 
I shall now try through means of figures and similitudes. If I can lead them to reflect and to move them to more carefulness in their salvation, alas, such was the stupid insensibility of the religious leaders. But their minds failed to comprehend the deep spiritual truths Jesus so forcibly illustrated in parabolic fashion. Those leaders likewise fail to realize that parables are the appropriate instructors of those who are possessed by the word of God and teach value the things belonging to everlasting peace. And then on page 19, the writer says, Beware, beware of misinterpreting parables. Beware of misinterpreting parables. Now, Let's go back and see some of the things that we've been talking about. We talk about similes, things that are similar to other things which uh, we can imagine to teach something that we cannot imagine, to teach a spiritual, to use something similar, to throw something like uh, he's crazy, uh, he's as strong and brave as a lion and crazy like a fox. We understand those things. Allegories. To say another, that is what the Greek word means, to say another, is a story or a poem or picture that can be interpreted to reveal hidden meanings, typically a moral or political one in the allegory. To say something different, to say another, to say something different. The word allegory derived from allegorain, to speak, so as to imply something other. See allegora, Greek, allegorain, to speak and proclaim. Literally, it says to speak another. Metaphor. Meta, across, and ferro, to bear. It comes from the old French, metaphore, which comes from the Latin metaphora, which means to carry over, in turn, from the Greek, meta and ferro, to transfer from one place to the other. We have the parables. That means to throw something spiritual beside something physical so we can understand it. Typos, that's a type, a stripe, to use types. Old Testament types were uh, the type of the lamb, the type of the doves that were, were uh, killed, the type of the sheep that were killed, the goats that were killed. These are all types of Christ that was to come. And once he offered his perfect life and shed his blood for our sins, there is no other. There are proverbs that are brief. In profane and ecclesiastical, a leopard cannot change its spots, neither a negro the color of his skin. The hyperbole is an exaggeration and riddles and riddles. Now let's go to the Word of God and let's look into the Word of God. We're going to get a, uh, <coughs> a beautiful story here. Well, not so beautiful story. It's a story of uh, anger lust, murder, and it is, uh, it is the, the fruit that David sowed. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. In Second Samuel, the 13th chapter, we have some of David's children. We have Amnon and Tamar. Now it was after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And Abnon, the son of David, loved her. These were all brothers and sisters. And Amnon was so frustrated because of his sister that Tamar that he made himself ill, for she was a virgin, and it seemed hard to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of of uh, Shemiah, David's brother, and Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He was a deceitful man. He was a scheming man. He was a confidence man. And he said to him, Son of the king, Why are you so distressed? Morning after morning, will you not tell me? Then Amnon said to him, I am in love with Tamar, the sister of my brother Absalom. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. 
When your father comes to you, say to him, Please let my sister Tamar come and give me some food to eat. And let her prepare the food in my sight, that I may see it and eat from her hands. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when David, the king, came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight, that I may eat from her hands. Then David sent for the house of Tamar. Tamar, by the way, is um, that means tall, saturistic. It means palm. Go now to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house. And he was laying down, and she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his side and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and dished them out before him and refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have everyone gone out from me? So everyone went out from him. Have everyone go out, have everyone leave. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom, that I may eat it from your hand. So Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the bedroom to her brother Amnon. And when she brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come and have sex with me, my sister. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. As for me, where could I get rid of my reproach? As for you, you will be like one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. This girl was willing to, to marry him, wasn't she? She was willing to marry him. However, he would not listen to her since he was stronger than she was. He uh, raped her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with a very great hatred, for the hatred which he hated her was greater than the love which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Get out. Get out of here. Go away from me. Get out of my sight. But she said to him, No, because this wrong is sending me away is greater than the other that you have done to me. Yet he will not listen to her. Now she knew that she was his wife. And she knew that she should stay this, after this is done. And she knew that her father would give her to him. Then he called his young man and tended him and said, Now throw this woman out of my presence and lock the door behind her. Now she held on a long-sleeved garment, for this is the manner of the virgin, daughters of the king, dressed themselves in robes. And when his attendant took her out and locked the door behind her, and Tamar put ashes on her head and tore her long-sleeved garments, which was on her, and she put her hand upon her head and went away, crying aloud as she wept. Then Absalom her brother said to her, Has Amnon your brother been with you? But now has he had sex with you? But now keep silent, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take his matter to heart. So Tamar remained and was desolate in her brother Absalom's house. Now when King David heard of all he said, he was very angry. But Absalom did not speak to Amnon, either good or bad. For Absalom hated Amnon, because he had violated his sister Tamar. Now it came about after two full years that Absalom had sheep herders in Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold now your servant has sheep shears. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, we shall not go lest we be burdensome to you. Although he urged him, he will not go, but he blessed him. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. And king said to him, Why should he go with you? But when Absalom urged him, he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. And Absalom commanded his servants, saying, Now, see now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, strike Amnon, then put him to death. Do not fear. 
have not I myself commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant, be brave. And the servants of Absalom did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and each mounted his mule and fled. Mules were animals of peace. Mules will have a hard time getting mules to go to war. Horses are animals of war. They all went in peace. Now it was while they were on the way that the report came to David, saying, Absalom has struck down all the king's sons, and not one of them was left. Then the king arose and told his clothes and lay on the ground, and all the servants were standing by with clothes torn. And Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother, responded, Do not let my lord were supposed that they have put to death all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon alone is dead, because by the intent of Absalom this has been determined since the day when he, when he raped his sister Tamar. There and therefore do not let my lord the king take the report to heart. Namely, all the king's sons are dead, for only Amnon is dead. Now Absalom had fled. Now you have to realize, David loved Absalom. He held him in his bosom. He petted him. He loved this boy. The young man who was of thou watch him and raised his eyes and looked. Behold, my people were coming from a road behind him by the side of the mountain. And Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come. According to your servant's words, so it had happened. And it came about as soon as he had finished speaking. But behold, the king's sons came and lifted their voices and wept, and also the king. And all his servants wept and kept on weeping very bitterly. Now Absalom fled and went to Tamar. Talmai, the son of Abinahud, the king of Yashur. And David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom had fled and gone to Yashur and was there for three years. And the heart of David longed to go out to Absalom. He loved that boy. This was his favorite son. For he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. Now we have a woman come. And this woman uh, tells a story. This is an allegory. This is a metaphor. This is a parable, so to speak. Now Joab, the son of uh, Shudrai, perceived that the king's heart was inclined toward Absalom. So Joab sent to Tekoa and brought a wise woman from there and said to her, Please pretend to be a mourner and put on mourning garments now and do not anoint yourself with oil. But be like a woman who has been mourning for the dead many days. <coughs> then go to the king and speak to him in this manner. So Joab put the words in her mouth. And now, when the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and prostrated herself and said, Help, O king. Now, this woman's an actress. This woman is an actress. She's an actress. And the king said to her, What is your trouble? And she answered, Truly I am a widow, for my husband is dead. And your maidservant had two sons, but the two of them struggled together in the field, and there was no one to separate them, so one struck the other and killed him. Now behold, the whole family has risen against your maidservant, and they say, Hand over the one who struck his brother, that he may be put to death for the life of his brother whom he killed and destroy the air also. Thus they will extinguish my coal which is left, so as to leave my husband neither name nor remnant on the face of the earth. This is allegory. This is a story. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give you orders concerning you. Give orders concerning you. And the woman of Tekoda said to the king, O my lord, the king, the iniquity is on me and my father's house. But the king and his throne are guiltless. So the king said, Whoever speaks to you, bring him to me, and he will not touch you anymore. And, he, and she said, Please let the king remember the Lord your God, Jehovah your Elohim, 
so that the avenger of blood may not continue to destroy it, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord lives, not a hair of your son shall fall to the ground. Then the woman said, Please let your maidservant speak a word to my lord the king. And he said, Speak. And the woman said, Why then have you planned such a thing against the people of God? This was a story. You might say this is a lie. She told a lie. She told an allegory. For in speaking this word, the king is one who is guilty, and that the king does not bring back his banished one, for he shall surely die. And like water spilled on the ground, which cannot be gathered, up again. Yet God does not take away life, but plans ways so that the banished one may not be cast out from him. Now the reason that I've come to speak this word to my Lord the King is because the people have made me afraid. As your maidservant said, let me now speak to the king. Perhaps the king will perform the request of his maidservant. For the king will hear and deliver his maidservant from the hand of a man who would destroy both me and my son from the inheritance of God. Then your maidservant said, Please let the word of the Lord, the king, be comforting. For as the angel of God, so is my Lord, the king, to discern good and evil. And may the Lord, your God, be with you. Then the king answered and said to the woman, Please do not hide anything from me that I am asking about to ask. And the woman said, Let my lord, the king, please speak. So the king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all of this? Is the hand of Joab with you in all of this? And the woman answered and said, As your soul lives, my lord, the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything that my lord, the king, has spoken. Indeed, it was your servant Joab who commanded me, and it was he who put all these words into my mouth and your maid, of your maidservant in order to change the appearance of things your servant Joab has done the same. But my Lord is wise, like the wisdom of the angel of God, to know all that is on the earth. Then the king said to Joab, Behold now, I will surely do the same. Go, therefore, and bring back, track down the young man Absalom. And Joab fell on his face to the ground, prostrated himself, and blessed the king. Then Joab said today, Your servant knows that I found favor in your sight. O Lord the king, in that the king has performed the request of his servant. So Joab rose and went to Geshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. However, the king said, Let him turn to his own house, and let him not see my face. So Absalom turned to his own house, and did not see the king's face. Now in all Israel was none as handsome as Absalom. Absalom means peace to the father. Peace to the father. Or peace of the father. Absalom was never peace to his father. David named him Absalom because his soul loved him so much. Handsome as Absalom, so highly praised from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no defect in him except his heart. And when he cut the hair of his head, as it was the end of every year, that he cut it, for it was heavy on him, so he cut it. And he weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels by the king's weight. And Absalom, there were born three sons and one daughter whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of beautiful appearance. So Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem and did not see the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. So he sent again the second time, but he did not come. And therefore he said to his servants, See, Joab the field is next to mine, and he has barley there, and go and set it on fire. Absalom is a wicked, treacherous boy. He's beautiful from the top of his head to the sole of his foot, but he is a wicked man. He's a wicked man possessed. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom at his house and said to him, Why have you servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, 
Behold, I sent for you, saying, Come here, that I may send you to the king, to say, Why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me still to be there. Now therefore let me see the king's face, and if there is any iniquity in me, let him put me to death. This is a confidence man. This is a con artist. So when Joab came to the king and told him, he called for Absalom. Thus he came to the king and prostrated himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. The king kissed and kept on kissing and embracing Absalom. He clinged to Absalom. Peace of the father. Peace to the father. Now let's look and see what this boy did. David's love blinded him. David's love blinded him for this boy. Now it came back after this that Absalom provided for himself a chariot and horses and fifty men as runners before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way. And to the gate it happened that if any man had a suit, had a lawsuit to come to the king, a problem he came to come to the king for judgment. Absalom would call to him and say, from what city are you from? And he would say, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but no man listened to you on the part of the king. Moreover, Absalom would say, Oh, that one would appoint me judge in the land. Then every man who has any, any cause, any trouble, any lawsuit or cause can come to me and I will give him justice. This is a deceitful young man, a beautiful, deceitful young man. The apple of his father's eye, the one his heart, his father's heart clung to. And it happened that when a man came near to prostrate himself before him, he would put on his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. In this manner, Absalom dealt with all of Israel who came to king, king for judgment. So Absalom stole away the hearts of the men of Israel. Now it came about at the end of 40 years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebrew. For your servant vowed a vow while I was living in Geshur in Aram, saying, If the Lord shall indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said to him, Go in peace. So he rose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then you'll say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Hebron down there is where Abraham's grave is. Very important place. Mm -hmm. Then 200 men went with Absalom from Jerusalem, who were invited and went innocently, not knowing. They did not know anything. And Absalom sent for Ahila Hophel to Gilanite, David's counselor, from his city Giloi, while he was offering the sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Now he's going to bring a civil war against his father and destroy his father. David flees Jerusalem. He didn't want to fight his son. He didn't want to face his son. He loved his son. He, his heart was, was, was totally blind. And then a messenger came to David saying, Does this remind you of the story that Nathan told to David? Blood shed will not depart from your house. Blood shed shall not depart from your house. You have taken one's wife secretly, but there will be one who will take your wives upon the household where everyone can see. The hearts of the men of Israel were with Absalom. And David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, for otherwise none of us shall escape from Absalom. This is David the king, the brave one that slew Goliath. This is the one that went after all the Nephilim until one Nephilim almost killed him. And, the, and all of Israel said, No, we shall not lose the light of Israel. You stay home. And that's when he did this terrible deed. And he could have, as Amnon could have had Tamar, David could have had Bathsheba if he'd only asked. 
Uriah the Hittite, he would have given him. But this is the kind of deceit that grows. Lest he overtake us quickly and bring down calamity on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. Then the king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king chooses. We'll fight. We'll fight to the last man. So the king went out and all his household with him. But the king left ten concubines to keep the house. Ten of his wives' concubines. These are ones without inheritance, but they are just the same David's wives. Every one of them he had procreated with. Every one of them he had covered. Every one of them he had, in the act of marriage, made them his wife. And the king went out and all the people with him, and they stopped at the last house. Now all the servants passed beside him, all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the Gittites, 600 men who had come with him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then the king said, Ittai the Gittite, why will you also go with us? Return and remain with the king, for you are a foreigner and an exile. Return to your own place. You came only yesterday, and shall I today make you a wanderer, make you a pilgrim in the land, a vagrant, while I go where I will. Return and take back your brothers, and mercy and truth be with you. And Atai said to the king, and said, As the Lord lives, as Jehovah lives, as my Lord the king lives, surely wherever my Lord the king may go or be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. This is like Uriah the Hittite, another faithful man. Do you think David is remembering back what he did? Therefore David said to Ittai, Go and pass over. So Ittai the Gittite passed over with all his men and all the little ones who were with him. And while all the country was weeping with a loud voice, all the people passed over, and the king also passed over the brook Kidron. And all the people passed over toward the way of the wilderness. Now behold, Zadok also came, and all the Levites with him, carrying the ark of the covenant of God. Then they set down the ark of God, and Abithar came up until the people had finished passing from the city. And the king said to Zadok, Return the ark of God to the city. If I find favor in the sight of the Lord, then I will bring me back again and show me both it and its habitation. David was a man of faith. He was a sinner. Now he's going to reap what he has sown. But if he should say thus, I have no delight in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me as seems good to him. I deserve anything that comes to me. And the king said to Zadok the priest, Are you not a seer? Return to the city in peace, and your two sons with you. And you, your son Ahimaaz, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. See, and, and by the way, David named his son after John, jo Jonathan, the one Saul's son who he loved so much. Say, so I'm going to wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. There Zadok and Abiathar returned the ark of God to Jerusalem and remained there. And David went up to the ascent to the Mount of Olives and wept as he went. And his head was covered and he walked barefooted. Then all the people were with him, each covered his head, and went up beaking as they went. Now someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray, make the counsel of Ahithophel foolishness. And it happened as David was coming to the summit where God was worshipped, that behold, Hushai the archite met him with a coat, with his coat torn and dust in his head. And David said to him, If you pass over with me, then you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in the past, so I will now be your servant. Then you can thwart the counsel of Ahithophel for me. And these are Bathsheba's relatives. These are Bathsheba's relatives that remember what David had done to Uriah the Hittite. These are conspiring against him now. His chickens have come home to roost. David's chickens have come home to roost. He is reaping what he has sown. It's a sad thing. 
And are not Zadok and Abathar the priests with you here, there? So it shall be that whatever you hear from the king's house, you shall report to Zadok and Abiathar the priest. And behold, their two sons are with them there, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son, and by them you shall send me everything that you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came in, into Jerusalem. Ziba. Now when David had passed a little beyond the summit, he behold that Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of saddle donkeys. And on them were two hundred loaves of bread, a hundred clusters of raisin, a hundred summer fruits, and a jug of wine. And the king said to Ziba, Why have you, why do you have these? And Ziba said, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride, and the bread and the summer fruit for the king's men to eat, and the wine for whoever is faint in the wilderness to drink. Then the king said, Where is your master's son? And Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is staying in Jerusalem, for he is today the house of Israel will restore the kingdom of my fathers to me. Now Mephibosheth has turned his back on the one that rescued him. The one that guarded his life. So the king said to me, Behold, all that belongs to Mephibosheth, that is yours. And Ziba said, I prostrate myself. Let me find favor in your sight, O my lord the king. David is cursed. When King David came to Bahurim, behold, there came out from there a man of the family of the house of Saul, whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera. He came out cursing continually as he came. He's cursing the king of Israel blatantly. And what does David do? And he threw stones at David and all the servants of the king, David, and all the people and all the mighty men were at his right hand and at his left. And thus Shimei said when he cursed, Get out of here, you man of bloodshed, you worthless fellow. You worthless fellow. You figwood fellow. The Lord has returned upon you all the bloodshed of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has given the kingdom into the hand of your son Absalom. And behold, you are taken in your own evil, for you are a man of bloodshed. Now David's sitting there taking all this because he knows he's right. Then Abishai, the son of Zerah, Zeruah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over now and cut his head off. But the king said, what have, you, what have I to do with you, O sons of Zeruah? If he curses, and if the Lord has told him, Curse David, then who shall say, Why have you done so? David is looking. He said, Well, this happened for some reason. Maybe God is really angry with me. Maybe now God is turning all of the people against me for what I did to Uriah and to Bathsheba. Bathsheba's family are against me. They're taking out the bloodshed upon me. Then David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold my son who came out from the seeks my life. How much more now this Benjamite. Let him alone and let him curse, for the Lord has told him this. Perhaps the Lord will look upon my affliction and return good to me instead of cursing this day. David is trusting God. David is a man after God's heart. He has done these terrible things. And he's sorry for them, as you can see. So David and his men went on the way. And Shimei went along the hillside, prayer with him. And he went and he cursed and cast stones and threw dust at him. And the king and all the people with him arrived weary. And he refreshed himself there. Then Absalom and all the people of the men of Israel entered Jerusalem. And Ahithophel with him. Now it came about when Hushai, the archite, David's friend, came to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king, long live the king. And Absalom said to Hushai, Is this your loyalty to your friend? Why do you not go with your friend? 
Then Hushai said to Absalom, No, for whom the Lord <coughs> this people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his will I be, and with him will I remain. And besides whom should I serve, should I not serve in the presence of his son? As I have served in your father's presence, so I will be your pres in your presence. Then Absalom said to Ahithel, Give your advice, and what shall we do? And Hithel said to Absalom, Go to your father's concubines, whom he has left to keep the house. Then all Israel will hear that you have made yourself odious to your father. The hand of all who are with you will be also strengthened. Do this terrible thing to your father. My uncle Joe Paul went and raped Sam Paul, my great-great-grandfather's wife. And then he seduced his girlfriend. And Sam Paul wasn't quite as gracious as David was because he shot that boy and shot that boy and shot that boy again. Finally, Smith Paul, my great-great-great-grandfather, talked to those two boys and said, Try, quit trying to kill each other. And then, in a drunken spree, Joe Paul killed his father. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and Absalom went to his father concubines in the sight of all Israel. This is what this is what the prophet of God, Nathan, had prophesied. In the sight of all Israel. And the absence of Hiphel, which he gave in those days, was as if one inquired of the word of the Lord God. So all the advice of Ahithophel regarded by both David and Absalom. Furthermore, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Please let me choose 12,000 men that I might rise up and pursue David this night. Now he's going to go kill David. He's going to kill his father. Now how much did Absalom love his father? He despised his father. He deceived his father. He got his father's confidence and then came in and took over the hearts of the people of Israel. And I will come upon him while he is weary and exhausted and will terrify him that all the people who are with him will flee. Then I will strike him down, the king alone. And the king will bring back all the people to you. And I will bring back all the people to you. The return of everyone depends on the man you seek. Then all the people shall be at peace. So the plan pleased Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Now he was, a, he was a master confidence man. Then Absalom said, Now call Hushai the archite also, and let us hear what he has to say. And Hushai came to Absalom. Absalom said to him, Ahithophel has spoken thus. Shall we carry out his plan? If not, you speak. So Hushai said to Abram, This time the advice of Ahithophel has given, is, given is no good. Moreover, Hushai said, You will know your father and his men that are mighty men, and they are fierce, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field, and your father is an expert in warfare, and will not spend the night with the people. Behold, he has now be hidden himself in one of the caves in another place, and it will be when he falls on them at the first attack that whoever hears it will say, There has been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. And when the one who is a valiant, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will completely lose heart, for all of Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. But I counsel that all of Israel be surely gathered to you, from Dan to Beersheba, as the sand to the, is by the sea of abundance, that your persona, you personally go into battle. So we shall come to him in one of the places where he can be found. And we will fall upon him as the dew falls upon the ground. And of him and all the men who are with him, not even one will be left. And if he withdraws into a city, then all of Israel shall bring ropes to the city, and we will drag it into the valley until not even a small stone is found there. When Absalom and all the men of Israel said, The counsel of Hushai, the archite, is better than the counsel of Ahithel, for the Lord had ordained to thwart the good counsel of Ahithophel in order that the Lord might bring calamity on Absalom. David's going to lose his favorite son. 
He's going to lose the love of his heart, the apple of his eye. Hushai's warning saves David. Then Hushai said to Zadok and Abiah, third of the priest, This is what Ephesiel counseled Absalom and the elders of Israel, and this is what I have counseled. And now therefore sin quickly and tell David, saying, Do not spend the night at the fords of the wilderness, but by all means cross over, lest the king and all his people are with him would be destroyed. Now Jonathan and Ahimez were staying at Engrogel, and a maidservant would go to tell them, and they would go and tell to King David, for they could not be seen entering the city. But a lad said to them, and told Absalom, so the two of them departed quickly, and came to the house of man in Baharim, who had well at his courtyard, and they went down into it. And the woman took a covering and spread it over the well's mouth and scattered grain upon it so that nothing was known. And when Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house and said, Where is Ahimez and Jonathan? The woman said to them, They have crossed the brook of water. And when they searched and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. And it came about after they had departed that they came out of the well and went and told David and said to David, Arise and cross over the water quickly, for thus saith Ahithiel has counseled against you. Then David and all the people who were with him arose and crossed the Jordan. And by dawn and even one remained who had not crossed the Jordan. Now when Ahithiel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and arose and went to his home, to his city, and set his house in order and strangled himself. And thus he died and was buried in the grave of his father. He hung himself. Then David came to Mahanim, and Absalom crossed the Jordan, and he had all the men of Israel with him. And Absalom set Amasah over the army in the place of Joab. Now Amasah was the son of a man whose name was Ithra, the Israelite who went to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, the sister of Zeruah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom camped in the land of Gilead. Now when David had come to Mahanim, Shobi, the son of Nahash, from Rabbah, the sons of Amnon, Ammon that is, Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar, and Bazel, the Giladite, from Regalim, he brought the beds of raisins, pottery, wheat, barley, flour, parched grain, beans, lentils, parched with seeds honey curd, sheep, and cheese of the herd for David and for the people who were with him to eat, for they said, The people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Chapter 18 of Second Samuel David numbered the people who were with him and set over them commanders. And there were thousands and commanders of hundreds, and David set the people out. One third under the command of Joab, and one third under the command of Abishai, and the son of Ruai, Joab's brother. And one third under the command of Ittai, the Gittite. And the king said to the people, I myself shall surely go out with you also. But the people said, You shall not go out, for if we indeed flee, they will not care about us, even half of us to die. And they will not care about us, but you are worth ten thousand of us, therefore it is not better that you be ready to help us from the city. So the king said to them, Whatever seems best to you, I will do. So the king stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by hundred and thousand. The king charged Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently with my, for my sake, for the son, my the young man Absalom. Don't hurt Absalom, please. He's the apple of my eye. I love him. Don't hurt him, even though he's trying to kill me. David's heart was soft for this boy. And all the people heard the king charge and all the commanders concerning Absalom. Then the people went out into the field and against Israel, and all the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. And the people of Israel were defeated there before the servants of David, and the slaughter of that day was great, 20,000 men. For the battle there was spread over a whole countryside, and the forest devoured more people than the day than the sword devoured. Now 
Absalom happened to meet the servants of David, for Absalom was riding on his mule. And the mule went under a thick branches of a great oak tree, and his head caught fast in the oak tree, for he was left hanging between heaven and earth, while the mule was under him kept going. And when the men saw it, behold, Joab said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Then Joab said to the men who had told him, Now behold, you saw him. Why then did you not strike him to the ground? And I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a belt. And the man said to Joab, Even if you should receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I will not put out my hand against the king's son. For in, in hearing the king charge you and Abishai, saying, Protect for me the young man Absalom. Otherwise, if I dealt treacherously against his life, and there is nothing hidden from the king, then you yourself would have stood a loss. And Joab said, I will not waste time here with you. So he took three spears in his hand, and he thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was still alive in the midst of the oak. And ten young men carried Joab's armor and gathered around and struck Absalom and killed him. Then Joab blew the trumpet, and the people returned to pursuing Israel, for Joab restrained the people. No sense in killing the rest of them. They're God's people. The problem has been solved. I remember one time a long time ago in the 1800s, my great-great-grandfather, Sam Paul, in Pauls Valley, Oklahoma, named after his father, they were having a, uh, a returning graduation party for Fred Wake. And uh, Gibson McC McKenzie came. Now, Sam Paul had been married to Lucy McKenzie, his sister. And uh, she was a pretty rebellious woman, and she didn't like Sam Paul's way, and she took off and left Sam Paul with her baby son, Joe. And Gibson went and told Sam Paul, I'm going to kill you if you don't take my sister back and treat her right. He kept telling this all to all the people in Paul's Valley. And he came to this party. And the people in the party went into the house where Sam Paul was and said, Gibson McKenzie is out there threatening to kill you. Stay in the house, don't go out. Sam Paul went outside. And when he saw Gibson McKenzie, Gibson McKenzie, he said, I've killed three men. I've killed three men, and you're next. If you don't take my sister Lucy back, I'm going to kill you. And he pulled out his pistol, and Sam Paul shot him through the heart. He fell off the back of his horse, and Sam Paul went over there with his six-shooter and fired five more shells into his heart. And when he finished, he said, well, that problem is solved. The problem of Absalom is solved. And they took Absalom and cast him into a deep pit in the forest and erected over him a great heap of stones. And all Israel fled, each to his tent. Now Absalom was in his lifetime had taken and set up for himself a pillar, which is in the king's valley, for he said, I have no son to preserve my name. So he named the pillar after his own name, and it's called Absalom Monument to the day that this was written here. David is grief-stricken. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Dadok, said, Please let me run and bring the news that the Lord has, has freed him from the hand of his enemies. So Joab said to him, You are not the man to carry the news this day. But you shall carry the news another day. However, you shall carry no news today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. So the Cushite bowed to Joab and ran. Now Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said once more to Joab, but whatever happens, please let me also run after the Cushite. And David said, Why would you run, my son, since you will have no reward for going? But whatever happens, he said, I will run. And he said to him, Run. Then Amaz ran by the way of the plain and passed up the Cushite. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate by the wall and raised his eyes and looked, and behold, a man is running by himself. And the watchman called and told the king, and the king said, If he is by himself, 
There is good nose in his mouth. And he came nearer and nearer, and then the watchman saw another man running. And the watchman called to the gatekeeper and said, Behold, another man running by himself. And the king said, This one is bringing good news. And the watchman said, I think the running of the first one is like the running of Ahimez, the son of Zadok. And the king said, This is good man, and comes with good news. And Ahimez called and said to the king, All is well. And he prostrated himself before the king with his face to the ground. And he said, Blessed is the Lord your God who has delivered you up the men who lifted their hands up against my lord the king. And the king said, It is well with a young man, Absalom. Is my boy all right? Is my son okay? If his son was okay, David wouldn't be okay. And I have says, When Joab sent the king's servant and your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I did not know what it was. And the king said, Turn aside and stand here. For he turned aside and stood there. And behold, a Cushite arrived, and a Cushite said, Let my lord the king receive good news, for the Lord has freed you from this day from the hand of all those who rose up against you. Then the king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? And the Cushite answered, Let the enemies of the Lord, my king, and all who rise up against you for evil, be as that young man. And the king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over his gate and he wept and he wept and he wept and he wept and he kept on weeping. And thus he said as he walked, Oh, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, my son Absalom, would I have died instead of you? Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The apple of his eye. What do you think God felt like when David did what he did? David was God's son the man he loved so much. And he killed a man for something that he could have had by being honest. Then it was told Joab, Behold, the king is weeping and mourns from Absalom. And the victory that day was turned into mourning for all the people, for all the people heard it that day, and the king is grieved for his son. So all the people went by stealth into the city, and by night and the people are <coughs> humiliated and steal away when they flee in battle. The people as who are humiliated steal away as when they flee in battle. <coughs> and the king covered his face and cried with a loud voice, O oh, my son Absalom, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Job, Joab came into the house of the king and said, Today you have covered your with covered you you have covered with shame the faces of all of the servants who today have saved your life and the lives of your sons and daughters. The lives are your wives and the lives are your concubines. By loving those who hate you and by hating those who love you. For you have shown today that princes and servants are nothing to you. For I know this day that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead today that you would be pleased. Now therefore arise and go out and speak kindly to the servants that have given their lives for you and have risked their lives for you. For I swear by the Lord, if you do not go out, surely not a man will pass this night with you, and this will be worse for you than all the evil that has come upon you from your youth until now. David is restored as a king. David is restored as a king. And David goes and he does exactly what Joab says. And then the, ping, the people of the Lord, they are given back their hearts. They risked their lives for David, but David was so worried about the one he loved. These are stories. These are parables. The story that of the horrible de de deceit and the horrible act that the rich man did to the poor man that David was so incensed with. Now Joab corrects the king, and the king becomes David again instead of a weeping child. When David's son by Bathsheba died, he dressed himself. He bathed himself, anointed himself, and ate. And now Absalom, Absalom my son. Sometimes we love those that we shouldn't. 
and those that love us, we shun. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you with these stories, these parables, with these historical events, and help them lighten our eyes and lighten our hearts today. Forgive us for your failure. Help us to be vessels of honor. Help us to be holy for your sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Help us to go out and do something eternal this day. Amen.